Hey everybody, Chuck Marone here with Strong Towns. Nice brisk little morning in Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> everybody's headed to school, kind of a fun time. I wanna to talk today about Prozac in the water. There was an article in The Guardian that went into uh, some tests they had done on guppies. Um, I'm gonna get run over here. Nope, that worked out okay. All right. Um, some scientists out of Australia did a study on guppies where they subjected them to low levels of estrogen over a five-year period of time. They put them in a tank and they dosed them with estrogen. They did a, a, a high level, a low level, and then a control group. And they looked at what happened. Um, they did this because, and I hope this is not uh, shocking to any of you, uh, there is a, let me sit the word that you, quite ubiquitous, I can hear them saying that in their Australian accent, accent uh, quite ubiquitous level of, estro of estrogen. <laughs> There's that too. In this case, Prozac, the antidepressant Prozac, it's a quite ubiquitous amount in the water. And when I say the water, I actually mean the water. I don't mean the water that you drink, although I mean that too. I mean water everywhere, right? Around the world, when you pull out water, uh, you are going to get Prozac, right? Particularly in rivers, particularly near wastewater treatment facilities. Um, but we've been doing this long enough and dosing long enough where you're essentially gonna get it everywhere. The scientists in Australia said, what's the impact? And they found uh, impacts on uh, these guppies, right? These little fish, they found those impacts. Um, let me read a couple of them. They sound reduced body condition. Uh, they were smaller, right? Uh, reduced sperm velocity, uh, which is important if you want to reproduce as a species. Um, and uh, reduced, reduced risk-taking behavior. And I kind of laughed at that one because I'm sure there's a lot of people saying, well, great, we can just give uh, males of species Prozac and they have reduced risk-taking behavior. Um, you, you might... You might think that'd be a good outcome for humans. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, in guppies, uh, you, you, you need a little bit of risk-taking uh, or your species ends, right? And so these were noticeable differences in uh, the ones that were dosed and the ones that were not. Why is this important, right? Um, to me, and I've kind of been obsessed about this, I did a video not too long ago about estrogen and chemotherapy drugs in the water. When people take Prozac, when they take chemotherapy drugs, when they take estrogen supplements, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that they don't, right? These things save lives, these things help people. Um, what happens is that your body does not absorb all of that chemical. And so part of it passes through. And when you go to the bathroom, it passes through into the wastewater stream and then out into the water supply. We don't treat for this. And so what happens is that it gets passed out uh, into the world. And we have been, for as long as we have had these drugs that we have been taking, that we have been using to help people, as long as we have been doing that, we have been low level dosing, not just all the critters in the environment, uh, but ourselves. I have this obsession about this because I, I, think it's, I think it's tied to some of the ways we talk about and look at our cities. Um, we have increasingly bizarre standards for wastewater treatment when it comes to things like suspended solids and biochemical oxygen demand and just overall turbidity. Th this is the kind of stuff that, um, you know, we get obsessed over inflow and infiltration and the idea that stormwater runs into the wastewater system. And we require cities to spend billions, small towns to spend billions of dollars that they just don't have, then they'll never have. Uh, trying to go from, let's say, 96% quality to 98% quality. You really are like marginal improvements at this point. And we do this, we have this obsession, uh, largely because we know how to treat it right? It's like you measure what you know. We know how to treat uh, turbidity. And so what we do is we measure the heck out of turbidity 
and we create all kinds of standards based around those measurements. Now, we don't have a measurement, right? We don't have a measurement uh, for um, Prozac. We don't have a way to treat it. And so because we don't have a way to treat it, we don't bother looking at it, right? Why know how much Prozac's in the water? Um, the only way we could treat that today would be reverse osmosis, and we're not gonna do reverse osmosis on every wastewater treatment plant in the country. It would, it would, the, the cost of doing that would be insane. I mean, astronomically insane. And so we don't do it. We don't measure it, we don't look at it, we don't focus on it. And I'm gonna say, and I don't think this is actually, should not be very controversial, Going from 96% to 98% pure in our discharge in terms of uh, turbidity is not that impactful, even though we're spending billions and billions on it. Going from uh, you know, having Prozac in your water or not having Prozac in your water or having much, much reduced levels of Prozac in your water is a big, big deal, but we're not spending any money on it. Um, to me, that is an interesting fact, right? It's an interesting thing about human nature. We came up with these rules decades ago to address the problem of the day. The problem of the day really is not the urgent problem of the day today, um, but we still like ratchet up and ratchet up those standards. Uh, we have a different urgent problem of the day, but we're incapable of dealing with it because we really have no way that we've developed so far to do so. Here's the other reason why this is important. When we look at permitting for municipal wastewater systems, we tend to, or we, you know, the law is written, the Clean Water Act is written, to in a sense continually ratchet up the standards, ratchet them up, ratchet them up, ratchet them up. Um, when we look at water quality, I mean, I live in Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes. We actually have over 13,000 lakes here in Minnesota. Um, lake water quality is going down. When we look at the cause of that, it is not wastewater. It is not generally human wastewater. It's particularly not human wastewater at municipal treatment facilities. Municipal treatment facilities are not the problem. What's the problem? Agricultural runoff, right? Yard waste and yard runoff. Uh, people who cut down uh, their trees in the natural forest and allow all that water to run into lakes and rivers. Um, why don't we deal with that? We don't deal with that because there's no point source. We can write these difficult to follow permits for cities and we can ratchet up their costs and ratchet up their expense. And when I say cities cost and expense, I mean your cost and expense, right? We can do that at very little benefit this robs us of our ability to actually do things that would matter, right? Like treat for Prozac when we figure out how to do that. Um, we do that because we can, because they are a point source. Uh, we don't do that with the farmer because the farmer is not a point source. The farmer's problem is spread out over a broad area. The lakeshore people are spread out over a broad area. They all contribute a little bit to this problem. This is one of those um, sticky situations, one of those difficult situations where we beat up on the person that we can identify that has to come to us. Um, that is really not the problem today. Um, but we kind of turn our, a blind eye towards the little bit of a problem that a whole lot of people are. Dealing with it would be uncomfortable. I think that that sells our city short, and it also means you're probably gonna end up drinking a lot of Prozac, a lot of estrogen, and a lot of uh, you know everything else, unless you do some advanced filtering of your own water. Uh, that's what you're gonna be doing. And that is also a tragedy.